10 years ago, the electric vehicle world was a very different place. There were a handful of electric vehicles that you could buy. The Nissan Leaf, the Chevrolet Volt, the Mitsubishi iMev, and the Tesla Roadster, of course, had been around for some time, but in limited production quantities. It had ended production in around 2008, 2009, and Tesla had just begun deliveries of its first mass-produced car, the Tesla Model S. But the electric vehicle world wasn't anywhere near as rich as it is today. Similarly, in the motorsport world, electric car racing wasn't really a thing. Sure, there were a few very small specialist race series. Electric drag racing was very much a big deal in North America. But track racing EVs was still, well, something of a curiosity. That's now changed. We have Formula E. We have plenty of other electric race series. And I'm here just outside of Oxford in the UK at WAE Technologies. If you don't know the name, you probably have heard of the company that WAE Technologies spun off from, at least if you grew up in the 1980s. Williams. Yes, that Williams. The F1 team. They spun off WAE Technologies not so long ago, but this company has made such incredible leaps and bounds in electric vehicle technology. They've been involved in Formula E since day one and have helped provide that relentless innovation and change in the race car industry to see electric race cars go from being a bit of a curiosity to something that attracts big dollars, that attracts big names, and could ultimately revolutionize the concept of automotive racing forever. And I am here today with Craig Wilson, CEO of WAE Technologies, and we're going to have a little chat about the company, about its history, and about what the future for electric vehicles is, thanks to WAE Technologies. Craig, it's so wonderful to be here at WAE. I grew up in the 1980s when Williams, the race team in F1, were absolutely dominating the sport. Nigel Mansell. These days, though, the professional race world is shifting quite expeditiously towards cleaner, greener, safer and smarter ways of still getting that adrenaline fix. Gone are the days of super fast F1 cars and in its place we're seeing electric race cars taking off. We're here right in front of a Gen 1 Formula E car. Tell me about WAE's journey through Formula E from those very early days, how you helped Formula E become what it is today and where the future lies. Mm. Okay, well, firstly, it's nice having you join us today and, uh, and for those sort of recollections of Williams, which I think many of us sort of share in that regard. But this, really, the story goes back to Williams um, had been involved in electrification, albeit in hybrid form, so this... Um, before Formula E existed, so the, the, if you like, the previous generation of powertrains. And from that experience, it, it had um, already started working with battery systems, flywheel systems, uh, motors, controllers, etc. And WAE was formed in 2010 as a way to continue to support Williams' independence, I guess, being an independent constructor. Frank Williams was very proud about that. The sport was getting more and more expensive and the idea was finding other revenue streams to fund the Formula One business, which, is, which was really behind WA being formed. In 2013, um, we were approached by, form, by the FIA and Spark, who were supporting the FIA and Formula E in creating a new racing series, an electric, all-electric racing series, which was then became Formula E. And they had a particular problem, which was to, to have a battery, a performance battery, developed in a very short time frame. And the reason there was a short time frame is there was a, there had been a previous company involved that withdrew from that involvement, and it left, you know, less than 12 months, or just, just, just on 12 months from the point we were 
engaged to develop a battery for the first race in Beijing in China um, in 2014. So it was our battery experience, it was our racing DNA, um, our ability to, to um, not um, let anything get in our way to make that a success is that, that, that propelled us to supporting that first season of racing. And, you know, when I look back now, it was, it was hugely challenging, but hugely exciting at the same time. For a young company as we were, it represented a great opportunity to promote ourselves and our capabilities in really a fledgling sort of era of electrification. I remember at the time there was probably only a couple of mainstream products in the marketplace, the Nissan Leaf and the Chevrolet Volt, and they weren't considered by everybody as being a mode of transport. You know, electrification was you know, really in its infancy. And one of the ideas of Formula E was, of course, to promote electrification in, and the use of electrification in vehicles in city centres. So we were equally as... Um, excited about being part of that story as we were about the technical story of developing a battery that was safe, reliable, you know, performance was high at the time. Things have moved on a lot since then. Um, but nevertheless, um, we, were ex we were also equally as excited about being part of the story of promoting electrification for, to a wider audience. And the actual engineering of the battery pack is one thing, obviously making sure that you have a battery pack that has a very, very high power density, can recharge reasonably quickly so that, I know that first season, you had two cars per driver per race, but that also meant you had to get those batteries turned around quickly between qualifiers, warming up, tests, laps, all of those other things. But also the engineering of the actual race car faces some some differences with an electric drivetrain that you might not have had in an internal combustion engine world. There are differences to the way that the geometry is set up, changes to the center of gravity and all of those other things. How much of a, of a change was that for your engineering teams to go from engineering cars that primarily worked on internal combustion and maybe hybrid drivetrains to going towards completely electric? So and we have a huge amount of capability in simulation um, and modelling and we apply that really um, on all the programmes we, we do, you know, extensively apply that and we did the same with the Formula E um, requirements. So we modelled and simulated all the operating environments, the operating conditions. Um, we, w one of the most important things we had to ensure, of course, when you're supplying a, ba a battery, let's say, to the whole field is, is also sporting parity. So all the cars and all the batteries, had, we had to guarantee race in, race out, that they were of equal performance. And the, the teams in the first year were, uh, I would say, 50% were quite novices in terms of operating electric equipment. The other teams were more, more able, but still not that um, evolved in their understanding, their knowledge. Um, but And as the years have progressed, the teams have become incredi incredibly... Um, knowledgeable and incredibly engaged with regards to pushing the limits and pushing the boundaries on the performance. But, but nevertheless, we had to guarantee a certain performance um, and, a, and a sporting parity as well. And we put a lot of effort and a lot of time into how we developed the batteries and how we controlled the batteries to achieve that, um, both from a thermal perspective, but also operating windows and charging and discharging and um, and the treatment of the batteries in between events as well, which is often underestimated, but equally quite important in terms of how you, you know, store and transport you know, batteries around the world. There's been a, a real generational leap between the first and the second and the second and the third. And I know it's, it, you know, in numbers, it just goes up by one, but that's not actually how the sport works. There are, there are interim engineering steps that go between each of those generations. Can you tell me kind of how much of a leap there is between a Gen 1 and a Gen 2 and a Gen 2 and a Gen 3 Formula E car? There's quite a massive difference actually between the Gen 1, Gen 2 and the Gen 3. And 
uh, and in particular, the so the power limits have gone up on in terms of the power you're using, but also the recharge potential that you, that in terms of the efficiency of the battery. So in Gen One, uh, bearing in mind these were in Gen One and Gen Two, they were rear wheel drive, rear wheel regen. So no, no, nothing from the front axle where you could expect to get most of your energy recovery from. Um, and even if we could have got more from the front axle, the batteries probably would have struggled to. Yeah, therm they would have been thermally challenged, you know, to take much more energy back in. Um, so, in the in the case of the Gen One car, we probably had about sort of ten for fifth to fifteen percent of the race energy was was recovered during the racing. In Gen Two, it was probably around twenty to twenty five percent, you know, sort of at peak, you know. And in the Gen 3 car, we've got a lot more energy and power efficient um, and thermally efficient. And we've become a lot more capable, I guess, as a business in terms of managing our control systems and our control strategies, you know, uh, um, to optimise that performance within a battery as well. And the amount of engineering and learning and data that gets collected off this car that allows you to iterate and, and actually just keep innovating as, as you go on. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great, um, I mean, I often say motorsport is exciting in itself, but as a, it, used in the right way, it's also a great research environment. So you're testing, you're really pushing things to the limit. And as I said, the teams now are also, and I'm sure we have, the, we have issues. I mean, it, it, every engineer, engineering organization does, um, but that's how you learn and you improve. And um, you know, as a business, we've learned so much from the involvement in Formula E that we can then deploy into other programs that we're increasingly becoming involved with. You touched on it just now, but you've got a very long background in the motorsport industry. You used to be in Australia working on the Holden race team. You've obviously worked here at WAE as a CEO, but when it comes to WAE and where it goes in the future, it's not just about building race cars, is it? It's about using the technology that you've developed here on other projects. There's so many different things that WAE has done in its short history thus far. Everything from electric bicycles through to working with major OEMs through to working with race teams. And that's just like the journey that automotive engineering has, has experienced in the past. A lot of today's modern technology that we find in internal combustion engine cars on the road had its start in Formula One. What technologies are we gonna see migrate towards consumer electric vehicles and consumer vehicles that aren't necessarily cars, bicycles, motorcycles, micromobility that started off here in Formula E? So in many respects, we're in a very privileged position to be involved in a lot of you know, exciting programs and um, you know, whether, whether motorsport is your cup of tea or not, it's still a great platform and a great environment to develop and trial new technologies. They have to work as well because it's very public. If they don't, then you know, every second week or whatever it is, you're on a, in a motor racing event and your car's failing or breaking down, then you know, it's, not, it's not a good look and it's certainly not a good advertisement for a young business that's you know, forging its, its path. The best is still to come because we, as a young growing business, our ability to have a bigger impact in terms of you know, ultimately climate reduction is, is, through, is through having scale and deploying products not only in motorsport series but much, on a much broader base. So if we step all the way through to what we're doing today with Fortescue in the mining industry, yeah, that's a, a, a major, major um, nut to crack. For us, and if we are successful, and we will be, um, that's something that everybody involved in the company can be really proud about in terms of, you know, decarbonising a very, very hard industry. And it's only through having the know-how and the knowledge that we've accumulated through a lot of our, you know, trials and tribulations through motorsports and other programs around, that's given us that that ability and that understanding of how to manage in that type of very different situation. But it's just. It's another engineering problem, but we now have so much more knowledge to hand to deploy um, in order to tackle it. If we had have been asked 
you know, 10 years ago to go and develop a, you know, three megawatt battery system for, for a mine haul truck, we would have said, you're joking, you know, like there's, we, we may have attempted it, you know, actually, that was in our DNA, um, but we have so much more knowledge now uh, as a business um, to deploy that, that gives us that confidence and that ability to, to um, you know, have a much bigger impact uh, on the environment. And that's really what a lot of people that are working with us today are, uh, 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 motivated by, you know, the engineering challenge, but having a bigger impact as well. A lot of people watching this won't understand the, the nuance that is a company like WAE, because most people go to a car dealership, they'll buy a car, they'll drive it home, that's it. And they will think of the car company as being the company that made the vehicle whose badge is on the front, they'll go to a franchise dealer normally for that car company. And they believe, maybe at least they tell themselves that all of the technology inside that car came from that car company. But that's not actually how the industry works, is it? Tell me why companies like WAE are so important to the automotive industry. What's the benefit of an automaker coming to you guys and saying, solve this problem, then trying to solve it themselves in house? So firstly, and you talked about quite a lot of projects earlier, um, and that is something that we have, again, quite a unique ability to be involved in so many different sectors, so many different industries. And from that you learn as well. And from that you are um, constantly absorbing and constantly learning and constantly re reassessing, you know, your own sort of views of technical route maps, you know, of what the future could be and what you could do. If you're in a large car company, you, can, you get a little bit of that, but it tends to be a little bit in a bubble as well. So you, you're only sort of as good as what you think you are or what you're capable of. So a business like ours, in some respects, has a fairly broad view. Um, and the fact that we're involved in accelerating programs, we, 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 a number of the programs we work with, we probably can afford to take more risk. We can take a little bit more risk. You know, and I've been in car companies. I mean, I started my career with Toyota, so I know what it's like in that environment. And some of your decisions are based on um, maybe being a little bit more conservative because the consequences of not being right are much, much bigger. And different projects have different requirements, but in, for a lot of our programs, we can afford to take a few more risks, and we do. Um, and, and from that, you also learn, and, and, and you gain a bit of an edge in terms of innovation, pushing the boundaries with technology. And I think that for some of the more challenging circumstances now that exist, that's, that gives us that advantage where we, that's why I'm saying the, the accumulation of all the programs, we have a greater probably confidence in terms of being able to deploy that now into more challenging projects as opposed to, you know, a few years ago where we wouldn't have been so confident. Where do you see the industry in the next 10 years? So if you're talking automotive industry, um, I think that there's definitely a very fast transition to um, lower emission and ultimately zero. I hate, don't like you use the word zero emission because depending on how you calculate emissions, it's a bit of a question mark. But certainly, low emission powertrains is definitely gaining huge momentum now. I mean, I think back just recently, you know, four years ago, it had no pre pandemic, in fact, it was like a light bulb moment as a result of pandemic, it really was in terms of companies that we're engaged with who are thinking about doing things. And post pandemic, they're now doing things. Yeah, a, re a really, really big shift. There's definitely gonna be a lot of, there's a lot of a momentum pull towards zero emission powertrains, but there isn't a single solution at, for all the applications that are required. So I think we'll see a, a mixture of different technologies um, coming to bear. Some companies are still figuring out what suits them best, and they really and, and they don't all know. I mean, it's, it's a bit of an emerging. If you think we've had what 80 years of fairly steady state development with internal combustion engines, and we're really in the first decade, really in the first decade of new powertrain types, because even internal combustion engines have become lower emission as well over the years. You know, so but more but bordering on zero emission at use, at point of use, you know, we're, it's still early days. We're still in a, a, a relative sort of infancy as, well as, as far as the industry is concerned. So it's a really exciting time. I mean, 
I, I remember talking to people, you know, sort of six, seven years ago who were quite worried and quite threatened about what was happening in terms or what could happen in the industry. But there's so much change happening. It's so exciting in terms of the, the opportunity. So I think we'll, I think we'll find um, a lot more efficiency in the products. Um, I think we've been on a bit of a trend of just bigger and bigger batteries. I don't think that's necessary. And we've demonstrated that through here in Formula E, you know, from Gen 1 to Gen 2. You know, the battery's 25% lighter, 25%, 20% sort of smaller capacity, but it can do the same race distance. So I think we'll see a lot of that coming into mainstream as well in terms of just being more efficient because, you know, even these battery, battery materials are expensive. They're, they're um, in some cases, quite a rare commodity as well. So we'll, we'll also see a move to some different battery types, so less dependent on rare earth materials, minerals, um, but really exciting time, yeah. And of course, big mining trucks as well. Which and, is, and big, big mining trucks. Which I think is probably yeah. the biggest electric vehicle you've ever worked on. It, it is, it <laughs> is, yeah. I cannot wait to see it in, yeah. in motion. I cannot wait to see it turning the mining industry a little bit greener. Craig, it has been an absolute pleasure. It's so great to be here at WAE. I never dreamed that I would get to, to see uh, this many uh, Formula E cars up close and personal. I actually worked on, on one of the commentary teams in the first season of F F uh, Formula E, but I never got to see them uh, this close and this intimately. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time and all the best for WAE in yeah. the future. Yeah, no, thank you as well. Thanks for coming. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon or if you are a Patreon supporter in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links below to our Kofi, Bitcoin and Swag store as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our self driving tier supporters. They are Paul Nelson, Mike Weeder, Denny Hyde, Linda Irish, Lance Schall, Mark Eggleton, Cyprian Laplace, John Trammell, Alan Tupper, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Sean Tucker, Pedro Mura Pinchero, Carl Hodgson, Tony Moss, Brophy Wolf, Kyle Fox, Hey Eska, Tazlitt in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Regine Fellows, Chris Centaur and Jim Burness. And finally, out of this world, thanks to our top tier supporters. They are John L. Henderson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, John Lyons, Kevin Burrowbridge, Andrew Glenn, Joe Hughes, Dave Kitchen, Joe Bresney, Nigel S., Matthew Drobnak, Eric Knack, Paul Conway, Stephen O'Donoghue, JP Fagerback, Reggie Watts, Marcel Ward, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Rory Litwin, Ellery Hensley, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday here on the main channel. Plus over on Sunday, we will be over on Take Two with our Sunday musings and chicken and garden updates. And with that, one final thanks to WAE Technologies for inviting us here. It's been a real pleasure to see everything that's been going on. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I will see you soon and as always... Keep evolving!